That would be appreciated. Um, and uh, if everyone could kind of find a place, find the places, and uh, settle in, and we'll begin. Each of our panelists tonight 
was, in addition to their professional relationship, also a close friend of Phil. Each will speak about one of the areas of Phil's historical work they knew best, but suffice it to say that each of us have been personally shattered by his passing. If I read the whole list of accomplishments for any one of our panelists uh, give them, and give them their full due, we won't have time for the program, so I apologize in advance for the Cliff's Notes version. Mark Hall Patton, and actually if you could, uh, go ahead, could our panelists could come up as I introduce them uh, and take a seat, I would appreciate it. Mark Hall Patton is a longtime close friend of Phil, past president of the Orange Community Historical Society and of Huba in E. Clampus Vitus. <laughs> he has been in the museum field for over 40 years, is the author of four books and over 450 published articles, and has written and produced 48 local history videos. But he is best known to the public as the administrator for the Clark County Nevada Museum System and as a regular visiting expert on the History Channel's Pawn Stars. He spent all day driving across the desert just to join us today. Oh, bless you. Dr. Art Hansen is a historian, author, and professor emeritus of history and Asian American studies at Cal State Fullerton. During his tenure at Fullerton from 1966 to 2008, he was the founding director of both the Center for Oral and Public History and its Japanese American product, project. From 2001 to 2005, he served as a senior historian at the Japanese American National Museum. Of his professors, Phil worked most closely with Art. Together, they charted an educational course that made the most of Phil's specific strengths. Stephanie George is currently an archives and museum consultant, local historian and secretary of the Orange County Historical Society. <clears throat> Previously, she was the archivist at the Center for Oral and Public History at Cal State Fullerton, Special Collections and Archives Librarian at Chapman University, and Collections Assistant at the Homestead Museum. In addition to her role as Secretary for the Society, she serves as the archivist and curator for our collections. Nobody watches and worries over all us history nerds the way Steph does. She will, uh, she will tell you about Shanghai Phil to help the Society. What she probably won't share are the innumerable times she provided significant help to Phil, often in clever ways to disguise the fact that she was helping. <laughs> Phil was an independent cuss. <laughs> Eric Plunkett is a math and social studies teacher at Travis Ranch Middle School in Yorba Linda. As an Orange County native, he developed an interest in the history of the county in California through his love of hiking. He has recently been working with Phil on researching and writing about the Portola expedition. Some of you know about the wonderful Portola tour and book they created for the Society last year. Phil had a gift for mentoring, both in scouting and in history work, and Eric is a central figure in carrying on Phil's legacy. And with that, with that why don't we uh, join you at the... Uh, here at the table. And uh, yes, Mark, okay. what can you tell us? <clears throat> oh, probably very little. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah, it's on now. Okay. Here now. Um, let's see. And I, I hope you'll give me a break. I just drove in from Las Vegas. So. Mm -hmm. and, Traffic on the I-15, <laughs> especially out by the 91, was not real pleasant, let me tell you. Um, I returned to Santa Ana in 1977. Just, to, just so that you understand, I am a local. Uh, my great-grandfather settled here in 1869, so I grew up over here. But I've been all over the country with museum work for most of my career. I've been in museums for 43 years. But I had come back out here from graduate school in June of 1977. And um, I started going back to the Orange Community Historical Society. It was a nice little historical society. My great uncle, Uncle Lee Young, wanted to go there because he knew a lot of the, the old timers that went there. He'd grown up with them, people like Don Meadows, who he'd grown up with in Orange. Uh, Uncle Lee was born in Orange in 1896. 
So these were just folks that he knew. So it was fun, that was great. Um, the June of 1977, I also met Colleen Hall, who became my wife the next year. That was kind of a nice thing. Uh, she still is, by the way. That's, that's <laughs> uh, just want to point that out. Um, the society was a really small society, and there was uh, one young man on the board of the society. And, and Paul, where are you? There. He's not young anymore. <laughs> but Paul was the only young man on the board of the society. And there was one young man that used to go to these meetings, and that was Phil. So Phil and I got to know each other. He, God, I hate doing these things. Sorry about that. But Phil and I got to know each other. Oh, thanks. That's going to help. Yes. <laughs> Phil and I got to know each other. And Paul decided he didn't want to be the only young guy on the board. So he finagled the fact that Phil and I were going to get elected to the board of the Orange Community Historical Society. Now, I was just starting into my career working at the Bowers Museum, and all of a sudden, Phil and I are elected to the board of this historical society. Oh, cool. What I didn't know was in the Orange Historical Society, you're elected to the board, and then at the first board meeting, they would hold elections to see who was going to have what role. Now, Florence Flippin Smiley, and a few of you might remember Florence Flippin Smiley. She was a very nice, lovely little old lady. She had the board meeting at her house. Me, being a very well-trained young man, when she asked me to help serve the dessert, I walked out of the room. <laughs> when I walked out into the room, I was congratulated on being the president of the society. <laughs> oh, really? Phil was clapping along with everyone else. So all of a sudden, I am becoming a museum person. I'm working at the Bowers. I'm the president of this historical society. Paul is not living in Orange at this time, so he's coming in for the meeting, but then he's leaving. And after every board meeting, Phil and I would take off to a local coffee shop and where we'd have milk and pie and sit there and try to figure out what the heck we were going to do with this historical society. You know, and we finally figured out that we were going to make sure that the historical society started in archives. The historical society didn't want to. We didn't care. <laughs> we just made sure that they did want. Now, Colleen and I ended up getting married in 1978, in July. So, of course, Phil wasn't at our marriage. He was at Lost Valley. I want you guys to know that. <laughs> He did all the calligraphy for all of our wedding invitations, though. That was his, his gift. But he couldn't make it to our wedding. Um, uh, but he, he, you know, when we started the archives, all the archives lived in the front bedroom of Colleen's and my apartment. Now, in museum work, you move to where the jobs are. People really very seldom move the museum to you. <laughs> It's one of the things you learn. So all of a sudden, in 1979, I get a job at the Siouxland Heritage Museums in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah, that's a little ways away. And so we've got to do something with the archives. The archives moved to the Burgandy House. And Chris may remember this because I helped move it there it lived under and around Phil's bed. <laughs> Chris is sitting there nodding at this point. Uh, because this was the sort of thing that we did. You know, this 1978 was also the year that Phil wrote his second book, The Plaza, with an intro by Don Meadows, um, and uh, underwritten for publication by your mother. Um, if I remember correctly. 
um, and uh, published by Wrangler Press. One of the things you can tell out of Phil's books, and by the way, from the collection of Phil's books that I have, it's over 40 books, uh, just oh. so that you know. One of the things that Phil and I started doing from the very beginning was anything that I published <coughs> and anything that he published, we made a point of giving each other a copy. So I have books that probably no one else here has, because there are some books that only came out in editions of 10 or 15 copies. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, we were very adamant about making sure that somewhere there was a copy of everything. And if you understand what archivists are like and historians are like, you want to know that somewhere there's a copy of everything. We made a point of doing that. So Phil and I continued to keep in touch. Even though I was back in South Dakota, we would call all the time. We would keep in touch. Any of you know who knew Phil, you knew that he was a good one for calling. You could be on the phone for an hour or two with Phil, have no problem with that. Um, you know, and um, we, we stayed in touch. In 1984, I came back to Orange County. Um, I Actually, it was 83. I did the first exhibit on the history of women in Los Angeles. In 84, I founded the Anaheim Museum, now the Museo. Phil was involved with me on those as well. Um, it, he, was, he helped me find images for the women's history exhibit. He, and, and one of the things I wanted to do was make sure that every image I used had a name attached to it, even if it was uh, an Indian woman. We knew who that woman was. He made sure I had that. You know, so we kept in touch all the way through. When I was found in the Anaheim Museum, he was part of all of my planning on that. But my career path always diverged from his. You know, he always thought locally, even when he moved to Hemet. It was an anomaly in his mind. It was never a permanent move. He was coming back here. You know, now, you know, as, as Chris said, Phil, even when he was on the uh, Western History Association panel last October, wanted to be uh, introduced as, you know, just a local historian. Yeah, well, his idea of local stretched a bit, you know. His, you know, his local could be, oh, maybe Helen Hunt Jackson and the Ramona men. It could be the Southern Immigrant Trail, newspaper publishers of the Death Valley area, the Cupeño Indians and their removal from Lost Valley, um, the Anza Borrego area, Randall Henderson and Desert Magazine, to name a few of the other local areas. <laughs> of what <coughs> Phil did, you know. Even when he did Orange County, it wasn't just, you know, businesses or churches or schools. He wanted to know about, you know, the Portal Expedition, but not just the Portal Expedition. How did it get formed? Where did it start from down in Baja? You know, how, all of that. You know, he wanted to know about the great land companies that had underwritten the, the development of Orange County. His, his idea of local, even though he would have been the first one to say, I'm just local, <laughs> it was his local. That's what we have to remember. Now, I would just say that he was one of the finest historians and friends that I've ever known and ever will know. Best thing I can say. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.
this. Can you hear me? Although I am tasked on this commemorative panel for talking about Phil Brigandi in relation to his student days at Cal State Fullerton, I must first stress one point at the outset in this regard. While Phil enrolled in many of my classes, we never had a professor-student relationship. Rather, we always regarded one another as friends and colleagues. In point of fact, I learned far more from Phil, whose father was my exact age, than he learned from me. And this asymmetrical situation continued and even deepened throughout the duration of his incredible life and career as one of Orange County's foremost all-time historians. While I had heard of Phil prior to 1980, my relationship with him really began in the fall semester of 1980 at Cal State Fullerton when he enrolled in a community history class of mine. I designed this class, which I ran as an interactive fieldwork seminar for the explicit purpose of salvaging and showcasing the historical legacy of writer Jessamine West's Yorba Linda. Let me provide you with some background information that led to my launching of this particular class for which Phil was one of the seven or eight student enrollees. In 1975, when I became director of Cal State Fullerton's oral history program, an early responsibility of mine was overseeing the transcription and editing of 200 interviews about Richard Nixon's pre-political years and fashioning a sampling of them into a published 1987 volume entitled The Young Nixon. Prominent among the interviews were those with relatives and friends within the context of the Quaker community of Yorba Linda, extending from Nixon's birth there in 1913 until his family's move to Whittier after his Fullerton High School sophomore year. Working on the oral histories relating to Yorba Linda made me increasingly curious about that community, which previously I had identified simply with country living. One interview particularly interested me, that with Merle West. He was born in Yorba Linda a year earlier than Richard Nixon, who was a second cousin, owing to their first cousin, Millhouse Mothers, from southern Indiana. Moreover, Merle had a sister, Jessman, who in 1909 had accompanied her family to Yorba Linda at age six, and then in later life achieved literary fame by drawing upon these two settings in fiction and nonfiction. I was familiar with Jessamine West's first, most notable, and best-selling 1945 book, The Friendly Persuasion, because of its 1956 movie adaptation. However, I soon discovered that her best writing was not this Indiana-based historical novel, but that nurtured by her 1909-1923 Yorba Linda residence. Legendary regionalist writer Willa Cather, who grew up in Red Cloud, Nebraska, once said, the years from 8 to 15 are the formative period in a writer's life when he or she unconsciously gathers basic materials. After reading South of the Angels, West's epic 1960 novel of pioneering Yorba Linda and Cress Delahanty, her 1953 coming-of-age novel about the town that accomplished for American girlhood what Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn had for boyhood, it was evident to me that Yorba Linda served as a palpable core of her writing. In these plans to her hometown, I found the harmony between the natural and human universe, empty hills, wind, water and trees, environments of family stability and security, communities and cultures influenced by the Quaker faith and Mexican ethnicity. Further enthralled by the magical sense of time and place in West's collection of short stories and autobiographical writings, I decided to make Yorba Linda my home. Two years later, my new historian wife, Debbie, and I even named our new Springer Spaniel puppy, Jessica. But let's return to the 1980 class in which Phil Burgandy was enrolled. After becoming familiar with Jessamine West's relevant writings and the town itself, the handful of students tackled field work. One student tape recorded interviews with longtime Yorba Lindans. Another photographed the town's natural and built environment. A third developed a bibliography of sources about West and the Yorba Linda community. Two other students assisted the ongoing Yorba Linda Historic Survey in cataloging what remained on the town's defining, uh, what remained of the town's defining building stock. And still another student generated media publicity about class activities and arranged class presentations for an assortment of community organizations. In addition to Phil being involved in one way or another 
with all of these activities in every one of the presentations that the class members made to a variety of service clubs, the City Library Board, and the Historical Society. He was a key and very informed, riveting, and persuasive speaker. Most of the students in the class continued to work on the project for a year or more after the class was formally over, even though none of them lived or worked in Yorba Linda. What galvanized their energy was news that the city of Yorba Linda owned the 13-point acres parkland designated parcel of land located at the corner of Yorba Linda Boulevard, Boulevard and Palm Drive, upon which stood the house that Jessamine West's father, Eldo, about whom Phil quickly became a recognized authority, had built in 1910 to shelter his family. The students had a dream that the now ransacked two-story, seven-room Redwood homestead could be placed on state national historical registries, the land on which it sat made into a passive park, and the house restored to serve as the Yorba Linda Heritage Museum. The two students who did the most to make this dream become a reality were Phil and Frank Hazelton, then a member of the San Juan Capistrano Planning Commission, who together spent hundreds of hours preparing and defending successful historical preservation applications. Sadly, this dream went up in smoke. On a Sunday morning in February 1982, when the house on the brow of the hill succumbed to a quote-unquote suspicious fire made possible due to the negligence of the city of Yorba Linda, which later used some of the property to build expensive townhouses, the sale of which funded the construction of a new city hall, with the remaining property becoming an active city park named somewhat pleasantly Jessamine West Park. A few years later, another project that I happily worked with Phil on came about within the context of another community history class of mine, whose members were comprised of a combination of Cal State Fullerton students and members of the Historical and Cultural Foundation of Orange County's Japanese American Council. That class was inspired by a major event held on the evening of March 31st, 1984, when the Japanese uh, American Council sponsored a tribute to Issei pioneers in Orange County. Held at the South Coast Plaza in Costa Mesa, 660 people turned out to honor the contribution of Orange County's pioneer Japanese Americans, 38 of whom were in attendance. With a notable Southern California television news anchor, Trisha Toyota, herself a third generation Japanese American, as MC, this event succeeded both in focusing attention upon the heritage and achievements of the county's Japanese American population and in raising $25,000 to support the cost of its historical endeavors, including a bilingual oral history project. Then with this funding support in hand, the class that Phil Morgani took a major part in worked as a town and gown team to complete the processing of the 15 interviews with pioneer and Japanese Americans that represented the first stage of the Honorable Stephen K. Tamora Orange County Japanese American Oral History Project. According to November 22, 1985, another Japanese American council event of considerable magnitude, Nikkei Legacy of Orange County, was held at the Emerald Hotel in Anaheim. Also emceed by Trisha Toyota, it netted the Japanese American Council another $15,000. At this event, in addition to the presentation of the completed 15 oral histories with pioneering Orange County Japanese Americans, there were two other presentations. The first was a published novel, The Harvest of Hate, written originally in 1946, 40 years earlier, by Orange County resident Georgia Day Robinson, who during World War II had supervised the high school mathematics classes at Arizona's Post and Relocation Center, where most of Orange County's 2,000 pre-war residents were incarcerated. The second presentation, and arguably the most significant in terms of Orange County history and historical preservation, was the invaluable survey of Japanese American historical sites relative to Orange County, which was expertly done by Phil Burgandy with the assistance of Jeannie Corral, an Elsinore journalist of note. After Phil graduated from Cal State Fullerton, I had many chances to be in touch with him and or his historical work. He continued to impact my Cal State Fullerton history students in many ways. His mounting with history professor Lee Estes of Chapman University of two ambitious conferences of Orange County history in 1988 
and 1989 held on the Chapman campus, provided the students with fortuitous opportunities to present papers of their own and to comment upon papers presented by others within a fully professional milieu. Phil even wrote an in-depth review of the published proceedings of those conferences, edited by Estes and Robert A. Slade, for the fall 1990, spring 1991 issue of the Journal of Orange County Studies, a short lived historical public policy journal that I edited with professors Spencer Olin of UC Irvine and Larry DeGraff of Cal State Fullerton, and a publication that Phil generously assisted as a fact checker and much, much, much more. In the late years of the last century and the early part of the current century, Phil regularly appeared as a featured speaker in the Orange County history classes I taught at Cal State Fullerton with the assistance of two truly outstanding graduate students, both active leaders in the Orange County Historical Society, Tracy Smith and Stephanie George, who equally worship Phil and are here tonight to pay homage to him. Tracy, would you stand up and here? She's sitting down, I won't bother you to stand up. Tracy, stand up. In some of these classes, I assigned a 2006 publication of Phil's Orange County Place Names, A to Z, for which I was honored to contribute a promotional cover quotation, which read, Brigandi's cogent and luminous entries are consistently authoritative, nuanced, and rooted in his profound respect for the power of the authentic past to shape and enrich the present and the future. I plan to assign this remarkable reference book to all of my community history classes. My students also were indirect beneficiary of Phil's encyclopedic grasp of Orange County through such venues as filmmaker Paul Bachhorst's 1996 three-part documentary, Visions of California, for which he served as a historical consultant, and the 2007 public television episode, City of Orange Road Trip with Hugh Hauser, in which Phil self-effacingly, yet deftly, toured the ebullient Hauser through Orange's past and present iterations. During the same time interval, when Tracy Smith and Stephanie George respectively partnered with me in staging several Orange County history conferences, Phil always not only extended a helpful hand, but also participated with intelligence and gusto in their proceedings. At the 2000 Orange County History Conference, I surprisingly found myself to be the co-recipient with Phil of the Terry Stevenson Award for contributions to Orange County history. I was in good company with Terry Stevenson and Phil Brigandi, which I enjoyed, but certainly did not deserve. Those two eminent historians of Orange County, along with others like Leo Fries, Don Meadows, Jim Sleeper, and Esther Kramer, to name only a few, are the luminaries whose prodigious output of landmark historical works have made a difference of monumental importance to the history and legacy of Orange County. In looking over my emails during 2019, sadly Phil's last year, I ran across just one exchange. It occurred on June 19th when Phil notified me of the June 6th death in Idaho of another important Orange County historian, Barbara Milkovich, to which I replied, Barbara would have been very proud with what has been accomplished in recent years by the Orange County Historical Society and would have loved how you have made its journal, Orange Countyana, far more than occasional and of arguably much greater significance and interest in content. In closing, let me make one final remark. Recently, in a review in the Public Historian Journal of a 2008 book by the renowned American historian Lynn Hunt entitled History, Why It Matters, the reviewer David Glassberg made this insightful comment. In making the case for why history matters, Hunt emphasizes the responsibility of historians to do more than write for each other playing postmodern word games. This statement spells out succinctly Phil Brigandi's modus operandi as a historian. For him, the work of a historian was anything but a game. Rather, it was his life's vocation, and he honored it with integrity and dignity throughout his all too, too short life in his beloved Orange County. Farewell, my friend, colleague, and off-time mentor. Uh, I first met Phil Brigandi in 2003 when he was the newly minted 
Orange County archivist. I'd been trying to get into the archives for years to do research of my own, but it had closed in the wake of the county bankruptcy. Um, the county library had handed over operation to pro wrestling aficionado and county clerk recorder Gary Granville, who never did restaff the place, but did give the office space to a friend. When Granville died in the spring of 2003, Tom Daly was elected uh, the new clerk recorder, and Tom made restaffing the archives and providing access to these publicly owned records one of his first priorities. During the search for a new archivist, Jim Sleeper told Tom that Phil was more than ready to return from his 13 years in of exile in Hemet. <laughs> <laughs> Phil had done some work at UCI Special Collections and had some training in the technical or library science end of archival practice, which added to his already vast understanding of Orange County history and how the records could best be utilized. He was the perfect man for the job. I visited the archives the first week it was reopened and met Phil when he was just figuring out what he had. The library folks had left no finding aids or clues, just room after room of often cryptically marked boxes. Within minutes of meeting me, Phil took me on a tour through the stacks. We peered into boxes trying to figure out what was where, a process we would repeat uh, <laughs> for years until we got most of it reasonably organized and labeled. Uh, we probably talked for an hour or so, and then I sat down with some files he pulled for me on Googie architecture and early Santa Ana attorneys. It was a good day, and I enjoyed talking history with Phil, but I, I figured that was about it until the next time you know, I had research to do. But a few weeks later, I got a call from him. Someone out of the blue, um, someone had given him my number, and he said, this is not a one-person job. And it isn't working to have random county employees assigned as my assistant. I need someone who cares about this stuff and who wants to learn. How would you like to come work for me? I didn't ask what it paid. I didn't ask what the hours were. I just said yes. And I've been there ever since. Um, I've been doing local history projects since high school, but never imagined that a paying gig was even a possibility. Um, five For five, well, for the five years I worked for Phil, uh, they were the, it was the best education I could have received anywhere. And, and I'm not just talking about basic archival practice stuff, although I learned that too. This was not a file clerk job, and as Phil often told me, you're doing the exact same job as me, just playing the tune in a different key. Uh, Phil taught me how everything fit together. He taught historical context. He taught me how to see the physical environment, environment around us with the eyes of a historian, and to look for details others would miss. He taught me not just how to be a historian, but also why. He showed me how to process collections, create finding aids, handle materials, encapsulate documents, read topo maps, and conduct reference interviews. He taught me how to keep my ear to the ground for historical materials that needed to be saved. He taught me that thoughtful accuracy was always in infinitely more important than meeting an arbitrary deadline. And he taught me that sharing materials and knowledge was the only way to fly, as opposed to hoarding it or putting up barriers to public access. More than once he told me, treating something like a precious treasure and making it inaccessible isn't much better than treating it like trash. He also taught me that the individual historians, the old families, the historical institutions like the archives, and the historical societies like OCHS were all intertwined and interdependent on one another as part of a larger historical community. They might somehow survive independent of one another, but none would ever really succeed or be relevant without the others. Local history, he always said, is a small pond. And the bigger the pond, the more patrons, the more people helping each other, the more forward momentum for everyone, and the more visibility for the kind of historical endeavors that make archives worth having in the first place. Phil approached history as a calling, not just a job or even a career. Getting paid for the work was, at most, an afterthought. Phil realized he had a gift, and he used that gift to preserve history for future generations, spread the gospel of community, and help others. Like most of us, he was happiest doing what he did best. Phil was not just a great mentor, but also the best boss he could ever hope to have. Too many government employees operate primarily from a place of fear or over-reference for the fickle whim 
students of elected officials. Phil, on the other hand, had a healthy disregard for such nonsense <laughs> and ran the archives for the betterment of the county, the public, and local history. Our desks were about five feet apart, and we were more or less uh, had a running conversation at all times, no matter what we were working on. Every day was interesting, in a good way. Having worked uh, in a gulag-like veal fattening pen uh, in the corporate of Irvine for years, uh, this was incredibly refreshing, I can't begin to tell you. It was a delight to come to work every day, and our patrons were the main beneficiaries of our positive attitudes. Phil brought in about 40 collections, at least, to the archives um, during those years, including many gems, such as the Knott's Berry Farm collection, a century worth, a century worth of naturalization records, the county's bankruptcy records, John. <laughs> <laughs> the records of the El Toro Marine Corps Air Station reuse battle, and the papers of historian and court reporter Liesl Slayback and industrialist Adolf Schopi, a name familiar to all of you Lost Valley folks. As archivist, Phil was a jack of all trades and a master of most. Uh, whatever the task at hand, Phil dove right in, uh, from sorting records to installing map cases to helping patrons make sense of arcane records that somehow held the answers to their questions. And he made everything fun. As he liked to say, too many people mistake being serious for being solemn. He was deadly serious about his work, but he was hardly ever solemn. The Orange County Archives was a fun place to be. Good work was being done, stress levels were near zero, Phil was sharing his brilliance with anyone who needed a hand, and researchers always told us how much they looked forward to their visits, often saying, this is the best experience I've ever had with government. This is wonderful. <laughs> Uh, it was truly a golden age, and I was so lucky to have been part of it. A 2004 LA Times article hinted at the flavor of things, describing how Phil approached his work, quote, with the enthusiasm of a kid on Christmas morning, unquote, and how, quote, with smiles, the archivist and his assistant, Chris Jepson, interrupt each other as they tell of a recent visit from a patron in search of clues about her grandparents. Um, Thanks to Phil's sense of humor, even the most mindless of tasks, like a full day of reordering jumbled records to match old indices, could end up being fun. Uh, we did that, uh, just that one day, and made a game of reading off funny names as we came to them, uh, <laughs> out of lists of thousands of names. Uh, <clears throat> one of us would read the name, and the other had to briefly describe the person that should go with that name. <laughs> By the, by the uh, end of an entire day of this, uh, we were nearly done with the project, having organized many, many boxes of documents, but we were really tired and acting accordingly punchy. One of the last names I came to was Fanny Sparks, which I almost couldn't say out loud because I was already laughing. But Phil made out what I said and immediately announced that Fanny Sparks was one of the side effects listed on the warning labels of Lolestro potato chips. <laughs> we both laughed until we were actually in pain. We had to go to separate rooms out of earshot of each other so we wouldn't keep egging each other on. It probably took a good 20 minutes to stop laughing over that stupid joke and maybe the whole evening to recover. But we whipped through another large project accurately and in a short period of time, and we had a hell of a time doing it. Things were like that with Phil. Phil never lost track of the underlying reasons the archives existed, and he made pragmatic decisions based on a great deal of knowledge, intelligence, and not so, and not so common sense. He threw himself into his work wholeheartedly and was exceptionally good at his job. He was there for all the right reasons. The archives were also scrupulously tidy and well organized on his watch. We always knew where everything was, and except for the place we called the evil closet, which we won't talk about, <laughs> any corner of the stacks was presentable for tours at any moment. His own apartment was similarly organized to the nth degree, 
And again, he was the perfect guy to hire as archivist. Although he had his reasons, I never quite forgave Phil for leaving the archives when he did. But Phil was, as his scouting friends like to point out, extremely stubborn. <laughs> I, I spent about six months trying to talk him out of quitting. I pointed out that he had near total autonomy in how he ran the archives, and that the job gave him, gave him not only pay and medical benefits, but also great visibility and a bully pulpit for local history. But once Phil made up his mind about anything, it was a done deal. And he decided it was time to move on. Ultimately, he did the one thing he always told me never to do. He jumped before he had a place to land. Not a week goes by that I don't wish Phil had stayed. Every one of our longtime patrons felt the same. They were heartbroken, and so was I. I can only imagine what the archives could have accomplished with him still on the team. Happily, Phil and I remained close friends after he left. We went to the postcard and paper shows together and stopped at different classic L.A. restaurants for dinner uh, each time afterward. I helped him find homes for Jim Sleeper's historical materials after Jim's death. In some ways, he was the older brother I never had. He stopped by often for lunch, and I called him often for advice. I probably saw him about more, once a week, in addition to phone calls and emails, sometimes more. And yet, I deeply regret not spending more time with him in the last few years. With personal matters absorbing much of my time recently, our late-night Del Taco brainstorming sessions and weekend expeditions to historic sites and postcard shows were effectively on hiatus. I thought they'd resume when my life calmed down a bit. Instead, not only am I, like all of us, left grieving, but I'm also left with the shocking realization that the entire map of Orange County historical work has changed completely. No major research project was complete without touching base with Phil to see what he had in the file. He was the one I sent people to with so many questions on so many topics where there simply was no point in turning to any other source. And in the back of my mind, while doing my own writing, I always considered, would this pass muster with Phil? I will always try to hold myself to that standard, but I will never again know if I've met it. Phil conspired with so many of us on so many projects. It's hard to imagine who else will share our enthusiasm so thoroughly, engage us so thoughtfully, or inspire us to do our best work. Even as we did our own work, he remained our litmus test, gold standard, map, sounding board, and ready volunteer.